Happy Father's Day everyone. My name is John and the lead pastor here at Johnson Heights Church. We're going to sing some songs this morning and in a few moments we're going to hear from Pastor Phil as he shares a Father's Day message with us. A couple things I want you to be aware of. Number one is that there is an AGM, a hybrid AGM happening this Wednesday, June 24th starting at 7 p.m. And so we need you, if you're a member, to RSVP by emailing office at hope to you .com and tell us how you intend to attend. There's obviously limited number of spaces for people who can come in person, so we want to reserve those for people who have poor internet connections or are having difficulties using Zoom. There's also some ballots that we need you to fill out and to email back to the church. So please check your email and do that. If you don't have the email, let us know and we'll make sure you get that. Uh, in addition, we have a weekly prayer gathering happening every Monday from 7 to 8 p.m. over Zoom. We want to keep inviting you to come to that as we lay before the Lord uh, all of our dreams, all of our hopes, and we ask Him for guidance and direction, especially in some of the decisions that we need to be making in the near future. So thank you so much for joining us today. And like I said, Happy Father's Day. Because he fixes my bike. I love my dad because his cuddles are the best. Because I like to play on the PlayStation. I love my dad because he gives me cuddles when I'm going to sleep. I like to go in the room, have snack with my dad, and rock chairs. My dad's the best because we like to cuddle with each other. I love my dad because he plays with me. I love mommy because he gives us candy a lot. I like fixing cars with him and he's also fun and he likes to do things too. Because he builds models. Uh, uh, but can you take uh, me uh, to his house? To build, yeah, like a car. Go on play drives with him. And the favorite thing that I like to do with Dad is play video games. Throw rocks. Throw rocks? In where? Like Go camping and hunting. Read books. Or I play baseball. My favorite thing to do with my dad is play daddy daddy games and wrestle with him. Basketball? Yeah, like that. My favorite thing to do with my dad is play Pokemon. Play Lego with him. I play hide and seek. Go fishing. Go fishing. To watch Mickey Mouse <laughs> with him. Go to the beach. Just um, find wiggle worms. Fix cars. Um, to play on a PlayStation. Look. And be a good friend. 
He loves me. Hugging. Uh, a dad who loves his son and his daughter and his family. Making Lego. Play video games. For helping me ride my big girl bike. For jumping so high. How to go hunting. How to do this. The best thing my dad has taught me is to be kind towards others. Mom. Everything. And happy fun day. Hey, good morning everyone, Logan here. And just before we enter into worship, I just wanna share something that's been on my heart this week. And it's centered around the idea of resting in Jesus and, and resting and having trust in, in who he is. And um, I'm reminded of the passage of scripture in Matthew 11, where uh, Jesus invites uh, people to come and, and rest in him and, and to come to him and, and do so. And um, I don't know um, if you found that, that maybe there's a lot of time for physical rest these days as our lives are different and then things have, have been shut down for a while and are slowly opening up now but but also this idea of of needing spiritual rest and needing emotional rest and uh and to come to him with with everything that we are and so i'm gonna get my face off the screen this morning and and just put the words up and and um i'm just gonna be picking along with with an acoustic guitar it'll be it'll be super chill and i just want to in, in, invite you to 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 maybe sit back this morning or i mean do do what you do but maybe open a journal maybe maybe start to ask god um, um what he might have to say to you and, and and journal along with that and and rest and sing and, and, and agree with the words uh that are up on uh the screen uh, your screen this morning and and so uh i invite you to do that and i'm just going to read this uh, this passage real quick as 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 we head in and it says hey jesus says come to me all you all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You were the words of beginning. One with God. What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you Great, your love was greater. So, what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! Yes. What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name. Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus i 
beautiful name is It's a powerful name Death could not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the boast of sin and grave The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised to life again Bless 
king of broken hearts And his love is like the mighty oceans His love for me will never stop
is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his song to win his erring child. He reconciled and bought him from Shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall. When men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure. Shall still endure on measure and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels. God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels.
must I say find their way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning to be able to share from God's Word. Uh, my name is Phil Harris. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. So happy Father's Day to you. Happy Grandfather's Day. And uh, I guess today is the first day of summer, June the 21st. So uh, there's always a time to celebrate. I hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, a lot of changes that are happening in our world. And uh, I hope that you're stable, you're finding your rest, and you're your stability in Jesus Christ alone. 
because he is able to help us through and uh, we're looking to him in these days. So it is Father's Day and I want to just think a little bit about uh, our Heavenly Father as we think about God's Word. Uh, Heavenly Father is a, a title that God wants us to think of when we think of him. Uh, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so he wants us to think about him as a father when we come into his presence. So you may have a, a good father like I did, or maybe your father experience wasn't as good, but if we have a relationship with our heavenly father through Jesus Christ, we have an awesome, amazing father to walk through this life with. And one of the things that is awesome about him is his faithfulness. Psalm chapter 36, verse 5 says, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Psalm 117, verse 2 says, For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. So we know that the Bible's clear. God is completely faithful. However, there are times when our Heavenly Father may not seem so faithful uh, to us. Um, one of the things that we prayed for with our three kids is that they would find awesome spouses and that God would provide in, a, in an incredible way. And so God was faithful to answer that prayer. And our, our daughter mar married into a family that was very strong and solid in the things of the Lord. Uh, Mom and dad loved the Lord. He was one of, of uh, five kids. They all loved the Lord. And uh, we were really excited for that connection. And so about November this past year, um, my son-in-law's mother had a seizure. And uh, she went through that and, and recovered, but they thought they should be looking into it and see what was going on. So anyway, they ended up doing a, a scan and uh, the results showed a mass in her brain. And um, they thought they should look into that a little bit more closely. And their worst fears were confirmed and that she had a, a cancerous tumor that was malignant and it was growing at a fast pace. And so despite all the prayers uh, that happened uh, through other people, through this family, unfortunately, three months ago, she passed into the presence of the Lord. And she was only, uh, I think, 58 or so. And so this experience that they had raises a question. Why, after all their desperate prayers, did God not intervene? Because we know that God promises in his word, Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Philippians 4.19 also says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So when you read verses like that, how do you marry those promises to the fact that in this family, God didn't intervene? Maybe you've had a situation in your experience where you've prayed for something and then nothing happened. Maybe you prayed for an improved relationship with family members. Maybe you prayed for a loved one to be healed or for your own health. Uh, maybe you prayed for a raise at work or for that promotion. Maybe you prayed for financial help and, and none of these things came through. Maybe you prayed for your family to come to the Lord but it hasn't happened yet. Maybe you prayed for a particular house or car but someone else got it or prayed for a better situation at work, and it never happened. Maybe you prayed for reconciliation with friends or family, and it hasn't happened yet. Or maybe you prayed uh, that the changes with the COVID virus and issues surrounding that uh, wouldn't affect you, but somehow it did. Maybe you've prayed for freedom from, from issues in your own life, sin, addictions, and you still struggle with that. It can leave you wondering about God's faithfulness and the feeling that maybe he has let you down, especially if it appears that others around you are getting their prayers answered. So I want us to turn together today to John chapter 11, where we see Jesus' interaction with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. We read in verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death, 
No, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So notice Jesus had acquired some friends during his ministry years. And in this case, it was Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Uh, they were siblings. They lived a couple of miles east of Jerusalem in Bethany. And they had had some really significant, memorable encounters with Jesus. Uh, Mary was one that comes to mind from Luke 7, where she came and remember she came to Jesus' feet. She wet his feet with her tears and she dried his feet with her hair and poured, anoint, poured ointment and uh, oil all over them, expensive oil, and uh, had a life-transforming experience with him. Uh, Jesus had fellowship in their house and there were other counters as well. And we read in this passage that Jesus really loved them. It says in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And it's interesting, the word here for love is philos, which isn't just some kind of overarching love like God so loved the world, but it's a love specifically for an individual, one that is special and one that is deep. And I think it's worth noting that that's how the Lord re relates to us as well. He doesn't look at us just as one of the many, but his love for us is very personal. It's very individualized. He knows your name and he knows my name and he loves us. We're very special to him. And so for Mary and Martha, it was very natural for them to come to the Lord Jesus, because of what they experienced in the past, it was, it was natural for them to come with regard to the need for their brother Lazarus. And so something confusing happens, however. Jesus gets the message. He says La it's been told to him that Lazarus is sick, but Jesus does something that's kind of confusing here. We read in verse 6, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. So Jesus had been back in Jerusalem, doing ministry there during the Feast of Dedication. But with the uprising with the Jews and wanting to kill him and to take him out, uh, he ended up going back to the Jordan River area where John the Baptist had been involved in past uh, baptizing people. And so when this need came up, Jesus wasn't near to them. And so they sent someone to Jesus to share with him this request and this need. But then we read in this passage that Jesus didn't leave right away. He actually waited for two days. From our perspective, Jesus should have responded and intervened, but he didn't. And the worst case scenario happened. Lazarus ended up dying. So if you feel like God has not responded to your cries for help in the past or isn't responding to them today, uh, you're not alone. It happened here and it also happened uh, with David many times as we read in the Psalms. He says in Psalm chapter 10, verse 1, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And so Jesus eventually did show up, but only after Lazarus had been dead for four days. The family's response was predictable. Mar Martha's response, we read about that in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. But when Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Then we read about Mary's response in verse 28. And after this, Martha went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Then we see a united response from the Jewish people that were there uh, comforting Mary and Martha and their family. It says in verse 37, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So the response, the verdict was unanimous. Jesus had let them down. And it's possible that there are some listening to me today uh, who may feel that Jesus has let you down in the past and maybe is letting you down today. And when that happens, we're tempted to ask these kinds of questions. Why did Jesus do nothing? 
Did we do something wrong or did we offend him? Does he no longer love us? Did he not know how serious my situation was? Does he not care about me anymore? Is he really, truly faithful? Can we trust him? So what I want to do this morning is I want to try to answer a difficult question about our Heavenly Father. Here's the question. How can he who declares himself to be completely faithful truly be faithful when our desperate prayers for help go unanswered and we suffer as a result? Let me just read that one more time. How can he who declares himself to be completely faithful truly be faithful when our desperate prayers for help go unanswered and we suffer as a result? So here's my understanding of what the Bible teaches about this. Simply put, it has to do with the difference between God's idea of what is good for us and our own idea of what is good for us. It's like when you grow up as a child. Your idea of what is good and right doesn't always line up with what your parents think is good and right. It's been really interesting to watch my grandchildren uh, getting a little older, and uh, we just celebrated my grandson's birthday this past week. He's two years old. But when he's with his younger cousin, it's interesting to watch that if she has something in her hand that he wants, he just goes up to her, pull, uh, puts out his hand, and rips it from her grasp. And that may seem like a good thing for him to do because he wants it to be, he wants to have that item. But according to his parents, that's not the good thing to do. So what happens is that we have this difference of idea of what is truly good. And sometimes our idea of what is good doesn't necessarily line up with what God's idea is. So how do you and I generally tend to define what is good in relationship to our lives? Well, a few of us have probably sat down and wrote out a definition about that. However, subconsciously, I think most of us would see good as the absence of any kind of emotional, physical, or spiritual suffering in our lives. So here's how we would generally think. Uh, when we have any hardships, or if there's the threat of it, uh, we go to our Father for help. And because we define good as the absence of pain, we think that it's right for God to intervene. And if he doesn't, and we experience suffering, we tend to think that God has been unfaithful and has let us down. But how does God define goodness? How does he define what is good for us? Well, there are a couple of ways that I want to share with you this morning. One, goodness for God relates to those experiences that help us to become more like Jesus. And the second thing is that goodness to God relates to those experiences that enable us to make a significant impact in other people's lives. So I'd like to look at the first one first. How does God define what is good for us? Number one, he defines as good those experiences that help us to become more like Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. So our Father's definition of good is that we would become like His Son, Jesus Christ. And so He works in our lives to achieve that end. And sometimes it involves experiences that we would define as good, but sometimes it involves experiences that we'd not necessarily define as good. So when it appears that He's not coming through for us and we suffer as a result, it's not that God doesn't care it's happening because he's working to make us more like Jesus, which is good and therefore would make him faithful. So how do hardships help us to become more like Jesus? How could that possibly work? Well, first, they are sometimes used as disciplinary measures when we stray from him. Hebrews 12.10 says, God disciplines us for our good, and no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. This is exactly how I came back to the Lord when I was 21. 
God allowed an event to come into my life which was traumatic and it turned my heart back to him at that time. Another way that hardships help us to become more like Jesus is that they're sometimes used to draw us closer to our Father. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we read that God had given Paul a thorn. And we read in that passage that, verse 8, Paul said, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And so we see Paul coming to the Lord. There's this relationship that's growing because of the need that he has. Sometimes hardships are used to create a greater dependence on his power and strength. And again, Paul talks about that as he elaborates about this thorn in his life. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul said, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. So hardships helps us to become more like Christ in that we experience more of his power and strength. And they're also used sometimes to help us to mature in Christ. James 1, 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and, not, and complete, not lacking in anything. We all know that it takes sunshine and rain to grow a beautiful garden. And sometimes, figuratively speaking, it takes sunshine and rain in order to grow us spiritually. Good times and challenging times. And that's how God works those things in order for them to become good. Sometimes these hardships are used to test our commitment to God and whether he can trust us for what he has uh, in the future. We read about the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 where Moses is saying, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. And that's what happens sometimes. The Lord steps back and he allows us to go through the valley just to see what we're going to do with that because he's got something in the future that he wants for us, but maybe he's not sure if we're really ready to take on that responsibility. And so he uses these challenges as tests in our lives. A couple of other areas that the Lord uh, can use these hardships to make us more like Jesus is from our text today. Number one, they can sometimes be used as significant teaching moments. When we go through hardships, it has a way of breaking down barriers and opening our heart to receive instruction and teaching. This was definitely the case when it came to Mary and Martha. Jesus was able to talk about his resurrection, and the reality that it was coming and that it was happening. We read in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said, do you believe this? Sometimes we can hear the same scriptures over and over again, but when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, somehow those truths are more deeply planted into our lives. And so this is one of the benefits that can come through these difficulties and make us more like Jesus Christ. But then sometimes they're used to open the door for us to experience a heightened measure of God's glory uh, in our lives. And so after Jesus had talked to Mary and to Martha, uh, we read about him now going to the tomb and listen to what happened at this case. In verse 38, Jesus was deeply moved. We read that Jesus was deeply moved and came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And you'll remember when I re read earlier from verse 4, the Lord was saying to disciples that he wasn't going because there was a, a situation he was setting up so that his glory would be revealed. So in verse 41, we carry on. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. 
And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Wow. Can you imagine being there for that event? Can you imagine the people? They were in awe. They were standing back, couldn't believe what they were seeing. But do you see what happened? By God, by Jesus not intervening and allowing them to go through this, and then allowing them to go through this hardship, Jesus was setting the stage for an explosion of his glory. And when God's glory shows up, people's lives are transformed. So how does experiencing God's glory help to make us more like Jesus? Well, number one, it brings us to a place of brokenness, reverence, awe, and worship. Do you remember the time that Peter, they, with his uh, other uh, family members, they'd been out fishing all night, hadn't caught anything. Jesus says, go out again, put your net on the other side. She said, okay, uh, we'll do that. When they do it, they have all these fish come in. I think it was 153. Their nets were breaking. They couldn't load them in. They couldn't unload them. It was just uh, chaos, but... God's glory showed up. And when Peter came back to the shore, he fell at Jesus' feet and he says, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And when we truly experience the elevated glory of God in our lives, it has a way of humbling us and breaking our hearts. So that when we come to him, it's not just so high, God, but we're recognizing that he is truly great and he is worthy of our honor. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. So this is how God's glory works in our lives. And when we have hardships, it brings us to that place where we can become more like Jesus Christ. Another thing it does is it helps to facilitate uh, our growth in our faith. Jesus said in verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see uh, the glory of God? And you know, it's one thing to grow as we read God's word. We understand more. We grow and deepen our faith. But it's also important for us to experience God's glory from time to time. Because while we can experience God's glory in one sense, when we experience his glory uh, in, what, in a sense like they did, it just changes our lives. It impacts us for all eternity. So from God's perspective, uh, holding back is not necessarily a bad thing if through those hardships we are being molded into Christ's image in one or more of these areas. Therefore, what appears to be a lack of faithfulness and compassion is actually our Heavenly Father being faithful to work out his good purposes in us but there's something really important to notice here it's not something he does just for his sake because it's his good actually we need to realize that ultimately it's for our good as well again think of our earthly parents we may not understand growing up why they didn't allow us to do certain things maybe we thought it was unfair and we were deprived and missing out but really the reason that they were doing it was in our best interest. And it's the same with the Lord. We may go through a situation where we're praying and he doesn't intervene and all of these uh, hardships result, but you know, we don't see the, the larger picture. There's something that maybe he's allowing that to happen for our good as well. So we need to be thinking about that. It's kind of like this illustration, this guy in a marooned island. He's sitting there and uh, he's built up some homes and everything else. Not a home, but a, a hut or you know, just so that he can survive and, and make it through his experience there. And then one day he drops something, he has a fire going and something drops on uh, a part of the house and it, the entire little complex goes up in flames. And so he lost everything and he was back to square one and he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, why did you let this happen? It's crazy. I, I you know, here I am in a room, that's one thing, but then now my whole little housing area here is all burnt down. And so anyway... Uh, the next day, all of a sudden, there's the ship that came uh, to the island and uh, people came on shore and said, hey, uh, we thought something might be up here. And he said, well, how did you know to come to this island? And he said, we saw the smoke. We saw the smoke going up in the air and we thought maybe there's something wrong. And so here's a guy who thought his situation was desperate, that he was being deprived, but in actual fact, it was something that, that saved him and gave him the opportunity uh, to be rescued. And so that's the same with us as well. God doesn't just accomplish these things for his good to make us more like Christ. He accomplishes these things so we can be blessed as a result. Because when we're more like Christ, we are in a very special place 
where God can work with us and do things in us and reveal himself to us in a way that actually deep down we really crave in our own lives. So those things that sometimes we don't think are fair and right actually provide a foundation and platform for us to experience uh, a greater measure of God's glory, faith, and uh, his working in our lives. So God's idea of good not only involves being conformed to his image, but it also involves impacting other people. So again, sometimes it involves experiences we would define as good, impacting other people, but sometimes it can involve experiences that we'd not necessarily define as good, such as what we see in our text here. But then see the kind of impact that this difficult situation, the corresponding glory that God revealed, look at the impact that it had among the people that were there. They took the stone away. We read about that. Lazarus came forth, was raised from the dead. And then in verse 45, we read this. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Isn't that amazing? I mean, how could you not help but respond and, and, and say, you know, my goodness, there's something to this man. He is worth me putting my faith in. He's worthy of my worship and my praise. And that's what happens when God's glory works through us. God not only helps us to grow more like Christ, but he also creates an opportunity or a platform for us to be able to impact many other people for his glory. Uh, think of Joseph in, in the Old Testament. I remember all that he went through, sold into the slavery by his brothers, uh, wrongly accused of sexual assault, put into prison, forgotten there, left there almost to die. And then all of a sudden he's elevated into a place to become the prime minister of the most powerful nation of earth on earth at that time, uh, the nation of Egypt. But then look at what he said to his brothers later on after all of these hardships had come. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Why? To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So you don't know that in your own life or in my life, when God's not intervening and we're going through these difficult times, he may be setting something up so that when his glory appears, that there's going to be this incredible impact in the community that's around us that we had no idea was coming, just right out of nowhere. Think about Jesus Christ and what he went through. There he was on the cross. He was beaten, he was bleeding, he was dying, and he was lonely. Where was God? Right? He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where was God? Wouldn't it have been right for God to intervene? I mean, it was his son, but he didn't. And Jesus died, but then he rose again. But look at what happened through that situation. How many millions, billions of people have been touched because Jesus went through the valley of the shadow of death. So again, think of yourself. I think of myself. Those situations there aren't the whole story. Not at all. When God holds back and problems come, it's not because he doesn't care or is being unfaithful. It's because he's at work doing something good, molding us into his son's image and setting us up to impact other people. So his definition of good is different than ours. And I know it's hard and it's difficult when we go through these journeys, but maybe these things will encourage us that something else is up, something else that maybe couldn't come other than through these circumstances. So there are basically three choices that we have. When we feel like God has been unfair in our lives and uh, has let us down. Maybe there's something in the past. You're still bleeding as a result of that experience. And you look back on it and you think God let you down. Or maybe there's something that you're going through right now. And you're thinking that God is, has been unfair. Uh, there are three choices when we're in that state of pain that we can uh, make. Number one, we can be upset with our father and not trust him anymore and even walk away. Uh, I know of people that have walked away from the faith because of what God allowed to happen in their lives. A second response is that, okay, we can be upset. Um, you know, there's, there's some anger issues there, maybe with the Lord. But then we try to bury our frustration while maintaining an outward image of being a good Christian. That happens. 
We can be out there and we can be saying, okay, yeah, we love the Lord, sing and praise the Lord on Sundays, but deep down, maybe there's some, there's some pain there. Maybe there's some separation between yourself and the Lord because you didn't think it was fair what he allowed to happen in your life in the past or maybe even what's happening here in the present. And what happens is that if our response is sort of like those first two, um, in terms of our responses to the hardships, uh, our hardships then become stumbling blocks, right? We're not unable to experience the good that God has for us in them. Whereas God may want us to grow more like Jesus Christ, he may want us to impact more people through these. Um, if we don't respond, if we respond in those two ways, uh, these experience hardships then become stumbling blocks for us. However, if we respond a third way, then these hardships can become a building block. And this is what I want to share with you and challenge you with and myself with uh, this morning. The third response is, despite the pain, we make the choice to accept it and put our trust in God and worship Him regardless. <laughs> Very easy to say. But you know what? Some of the greatest servants in the world, history, throughout the Bible, when they made that choice, God was able to do incredible things. So David's one of those examples. One of the Psalms I go to often is Psalm 13, when I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, where David writes these words about his situation. He's honest with the Lord. He says, Lord, how long? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. David was not going through an easy time, right? A lot of us know what that's like. But David made a choice, and that's where we read it in verse 5. That's a miraculous choice. He said, but I trust in your unfailing love. He wasn't going to conclude that God wasn't fair and that this was unjust and God had no right to leave him in the state. He said, no, I'm going to choose. He said, I'm going to choose to trust you and declare your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. Wow, isn't that amazing? I wish I could do that every time I face hardships. God didn't intervene and there was much pain, but he made the choice to trust God and sing his praises. And those experiences for David became multiple, multiple building blocks that he continued to use and to build upon and he was a man after God's own heart. God used him, God blessed him, one of the great leaders, the king, kings of the nation of Israel. So I want to encourage you that when you face a situation where you're questioning God's love for you, hardships have come, you don't know why. I want to encourage you this morning to trust him, to really trust him. Why? Because he really loves you, ultimately. He's doing something. You can trust him in this situation. Uh, he does love us. And we know about his love. We know about it because, I mean, he said he loved us from Genesis to Revelation. He's told us over and over again. We know he loves us because he's created us. We know he loves us because he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. We know he loves us because he's been faithful to us in the past. We know he loves us because he's with us and he feels our pain. He knows what it's like to not have the intervention of his father he loves us. He knows what we're going through. But think about his love from this angle, the fact that we are his children. I know that the first time I saw my children, it was just amazing to me. Two things happened. Number one, I wasn't prepared for the intense love that I had for them. I saw them there and I just couldn't believe that I had been blessed with these kids and the connection with them was just overwhelming. Uh, the second thing that happened was that when they came into this world, I just had this overwhelming sense that I wanted to care for them, 
that nothing was going to get in the way. Whatever was required of me, I was going to care for them, commit myself to them to do whatever was in their best interests. I was dedicated and wanted to do that. And so don't you think that the Lord feels the same way about us? Because when we think about his love for us, we are his children. And he loves us beyond words. And his desire to care for us and take care for us is there. So that's why I want to encourage you to trust him. Because he deeply, deeply loves us. And so we can be here today and maybe we're going through a a challenge. We're feeling the pain. Uh, Maybe things seem uh, unfair. But we can trust him because he truly truly loves us. That's what Job chose to do. He trusted the Lord. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. But he chose to trust the Lord. Listen to what he says in Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And this is what my son-in-law's family is endeavoring to do as well. It's not easy. But they're trusting the Lord. They're moving forward. And they're thanking the Lord for his goodness in their lives. So maybe you're here today and you're going through some challenges. I want to encourage you to look to the Lord. Maybe you're here and you've never had that relationship with him. I want to invite you just to say a prayer with me so that you can enter into this relationship with him, your heavenly father. Just say this simple prayer. Lord, I need you in my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've gone my own way, but I want you to be my heavenly father. So I ask you to take away my sin. I ask you to come into my heart and to make me one of your children so that I can experience the fullness of what you have for my life and know that everything will work together for good. I love you. Please do that for me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Or maybe you're here today and, you know, as you look at your past life, you've seen some situations where you've wondered if God has been faithful to you. Maybe it's affected you and your ability to be able to move forward in your walk with him. I just want to invite you to to pray a very simple prayer with me as well if you'd like to change uh, that and to to wipe that away. Just say, Lord, I, I recognize that in my own life that I've allowed certain circumstances to hinder my relationship with you. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me for that that you will wipe it away, that you will restore my relationship with you so that I can be at your feet, that I can experience the fullness of your love, the fullness of your purposes that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. Happy Father's Day, Grandfather's Day, and I hope you have a tremendous and wonderful day. Thanks.
the storm was rolled away forever. You're alive forever. You're alive. Jesus, Savior, my God, my King. Thanks so much for sharing the word with us today, Pastor Phil. And if any of you have any questions whatsoever about Johnson Heights Church, how you can get connected or just information about how we're supporting our community or how you can get involved, how you can give, please check out our church website, hopetoyou.com or email the church office at hopetoyou.com. We'd love to be in touch with you. Just a reminder about the AGM happening this Wednesday and our weekly prayer gathering happening this Monday. Well, thank you so much for joining us and happy Father's Day.